evening everybody. It's a pleasure for me to make uh, an introduction and to share several reflections uh, before this talk. That I would like to start thanking our school for the organization in this particular period and our guest Sean Godsell who spent with us a very interesting evening in the temple of San Sebastiano in May 2017 for presenting his work, four years after his first lecture in Mantova. Almost three years have passed from that evening and uh, many other interventions were uh, in the meanwhile completed. Among them uh, the House in the Hills in Victoria and the project for the Vatican chapels uh, in the last Venice Biennale in 2018. But I think that uh, seeing the results of these new works, many themes we discussed that time are still valid today. I believe that in a moment like this, characterized by a series of drifts towards uh, the blind formalism and the structural exhibitionism, it is very important to give space to several authors who are interpreting, through their work and their research, methodological principles that take back architecture to its real and authentic purposes. Sean Godsell is certainly one of those. After an educational path started with his father, who used to bring him to the construction sites since he was five years old, continued in London with Sir Dennis Lasdun from 1986 to 1988 and strengthened distilling the lesson of several great masters of the past, among them Palladio and Michelangelo, to fundamental and explicit references for projects as the RMIT Design Hub, he started a design and research itinerary that, uh, from the opening of his own office in Melbourne 25 years ago, led him to complete a series of very remarkable works and to become one of the points of reference of the international architectural culture. So much to be named by the English magazine Wallpaper as one of the 10 persons who will change in the future our way of living. Among the works that he presented in this talk, that includes uh, above all the houses, but also several urban interventions as the RMIT Design Hub, temporary structures as the M Pavilion in Melbourne, and projects of social design as the Future Shack, a relocatable house for emergency, and the Park Bench House devoted to people who live without any form of shelter, three seems to be the most recurring themes. First, the relationship between architecture and place. A relationship that is never invasive, but always respectful, discreet and harmonic. And that becomes explicit uh, on the one hand uh, in the relationship between the figure and the background. I'm thinking about the Warburton Trail pedestrian bridge, conceived uh, as a kind of permeable filter where the spaces between the stripes of the outer skin allow not only to identify immediately the structural skeleton, but also to avoid to produce visual limits to the surrounding landscape. On the other hand, in the relationship between the building and the soil, that means uh, acting always in the most appropriate modality, according with the specific conditions of the site, in its uh, orographic components uh, and considering the existing vegetation. With the volumes that are leaned uh, among the ripples of the soil, as in the Cutter Tucker House uh, or in the Peninsula House, or creating new artificial facades 
lifted from the ground, as in the Q house or in the St. Andrew's Beach House. The second theme is the relationship between architecture and construction. That means uh, avoiding the standardized detail, the one that leads to the flattening and to the homogenization of taste, in favor of a definition that is always accurate, personal and appropriate with the specificities of the building. That aims to an economy of resources uh, intended as research of the essential, in an idea of frankness that forces, as explained uh, in the presentation of the Warburton Trail pedestrian bridge, to account for each nut and each bolt, far from the decorativism or the structural redundance. That, uh, and this is an aspect of great interest for understanding the rigor and the foresight of this working method, is put in the perspective of a progressive improvement of the details, significantly conceiving each project as the heir of the lesson of its predecessors. But there is also a third theme that I believe is more important, that concerns the subtle relationship between architecture and time, that for some reasons can be interpreted as a kind of first derivative of the previous ones. I think that this research is fully present uh, above all in the most recent works. And uh, after a very illuminating discussion we had uh, in Melbourne a few years ago, coming back from an international workshop uh, organized in Australia with the students of the Mantova seat of Politecnico di Milano, I had the occasion of corroborating this conviction. In an essay written in 1962, almost with the same age of our guest, George Kubler affirmed the necessity of distinguishing different shapes of time, sustaining that, uh, as in the natural phenomena, also the history of the things is characterized by the overlapping of different velocities. One is the glacier-like pace of cumulative drift. The other is instead the swift mode that resembles a forest fire in its leaping action across great distances. I believe that also in architecture we should reflect on the potentialities and sometimes on the contrary also on the problems of the different velocities of time. And I believe that many buildings by Sean Godsell are good interpreters of this relationship, in the double conception of a time that is both cyclic and linear. As in many houses, from the Q House to the St. Andrew's Beach House, where the use of weathering steel allows to represent the action of time on the construction, thanks to the formation of the patina and thanks to a metamorphosis, tactile and visual, that happens much more quickly than in other materials. As in the RMIT Design Hub, that uh, on the one hand, in the short term of the evolution of a day, presents interior spaces that are continuously changing, thanks uh, to the different angles uh, and the intensity of the light that comes from the spaces between the discs on the facade. And that, uh, on the other hand, considering the long term of the building life, aims to an adaptive configuration of the cladding, where those discs can be substituted over time, with photovoltaic cells or little interactive screens, to increase the energy performance or experiment with new levels of interactivity. But if we try to widen our glance, extending the analysis to what is behind these works, 
we discover that uh, perhaps the greatest lesson from this point of view is that uh, this relationship with time doesn't regard only the building but also something more important the process that leads to the construction of the building in the short notes uh, about the project representation that appeared uh, on Casabella in 2008 for the presentation of the Glenburn House, Godsell illustrated several constants of his design approach. The importance of drawing by hand, that goes uh, from the section of the critical pieces uh, to the analysis of the details, always made on big papers, uh, drawing with the pencil that always accompanies his projects. The necessity that the indications taken in the detailed definition can imply changes also at a broader level, in a continuous shift between the scale of the detail and the one of the building. And finally, as a consequence of the two previous ones, the choice of adopting a slow process that allows, uh, through the idea of uh, using his words, uh, regularly refining, constantly reviewing, to document in a very meticulous way the structure of the buildings and to verify the exactness of the joints and their coherency with the whole. And on this aspect, I end my introduction. I believe in the importance of coming back to the slowness to an idea of project uh, that is made of uh, writing and rewriting, to a conception of the design process uh, where there is enough space also for re-examining, rethinking and reviewing. I believe that uh, this is one of the aspects we should defend in our profession. I believe that uh, this is one of the questions Sean Godsell's work suggests to reflect on. Uh, I just wanted to start by thanking um, um, Federico Bucci and Francesca Ferrari for inviting me back to Mantova. It's like coming home. Uh, everyone is so kind and warm and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here again in this magnificent space. Um, and, a, and a special hello to Francesco Delco who has supported my office for 20 plus years and, and has been a consistent source of support to give a voice to my work um, from 12,000 kilometres away is, is always appreciated, so thank you. It's great to see you. Um, uh, tonight the idea is that um, you can ask me, I'm not talking about all these projects, in the time that we have, I'll talk about whichever ones you would like to hear more about. Um, I think it's nice for architects to hear about the stories behind the work as much as to be preached at by, by architects zealously and with, um, with agendas. So I thought I'd start with a, a very humble project, very small, but walking through Mantova today reminded me of this project um, Four years ago, when I was last here, Francesco took, uh, took Anne Marie and I to see Palazzo del Te, the, the, the masterwork of Giulio Romano. And of course, we're in Alberti right now. And uh, for the students of architecture here, all you need to do to learn everything you need to know about architecture is, is walk from the Piazza Urbe through to the Decale and you'll, if, you're, if you're understanding what you're seeing, you'll learn it all. Um, I came back to Australia after that trip inspired. I wanted to build a building with a, with a vault and an arch and, and build a building out of massive masonry or concrete, the antithesis of my work. I still haven't managed to achieve that, but in a tiny, very humble project, um, and the story behind this, this, this project here, is related directly to the Palazzo del Te and Giulia Romano. 
In Australia, if a building is 100 years old, it's considered very old. I know that's difficult for you to understand that it's true. And this, this little cottage, little wooden cottage, was such a building. These clients came and asked me to do a new house, and uh, I said, fantastic. We started down the, the route of designing a new house. The heritage architects wouldn't let me pull, pull down this cottage. So that was, the, that was the building, a little worker's cottage, a beautiful plan, in fact, no corridor. Interesting, very Japanese, but ruined. To cut a long story short, I got very cross about being told I couldn't design the house that I wanted for this. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take you at your word and I'll, and I'll deal with the heritage aspect of the, of the cottage, which became a kitchen and a, and a living room, make a small courtyard and then add two more rooms, a sitting room and a bedroom. So the client was a couple whose children had left home, they lived in a large house and they wanted to go to a very small building. But I wasn't happy about keeping this building, so I did some, some stuff to it. The facade became polychromatic, which we see at the Decali in the, in the, in the uh, Giulia Romano section of the building. In heritage colours, of course, it became white and red and white and red and white and red. If you take a close look at the stripes they run through this element introduced by me to socialise the veranda space to give a place for the owners to talk to passing um, pedestrian traffic. This building is very close to the University of Melbourne so uh, students walk by and that bench is a place for the owners to sit and talk to students. But when you start to look more closely at this facade you see some, some mannerism almost coming into play where the weather moulds move past the window sill there and they move to the side there. We know in the fenestration of Palazzo del, del Te that the rhythm is changed and altered. And so my argument back to the heritage architects in the city of Melbourne was that this was an exercise in, in heritage architecture and a far more academic one than simply preserving a meaningless old timber building. And they struggled to counter that argument because my argument was based in historic fact, inspired from our trip out to the Palazzo four years ago. Um, to this day, the heritage architects are scratching their head, not sure what to say about this, but they haven't told me to take the stripes off. So I feel like architecture won a small battle there. The rest of the building in projects like this became an exercise in, in investigating detail and, and the work of other architects that I like without ever believing that this project would be on the cover of a magazine or be um, lauded around the world. Um, there are little things in, in, in this scheme point to the introduction of light which was coming out of Kazuo Shinohara's second phase of, of work. A little chair that we designed for another project. Um, another historic reference back to the, to the hard plaster, the lathe and plaster technique from a hundred years ago that existed in this building. Um, I'm not sure whether I have a photo, but a, a reference to Elto's Villa Maria in, in two posts that hold, hold up the ridge line. <clears throat> and then um, slightly more contemporary interpretation of how to introduce light into a, into a row house that's bound by light, but by walls. And so here a direct reference to Tadao Ando's Sumiyoshi row house. So for me, a project like this is a lot of fun to do because it's away from the main investigation in my office, but still a chance to uh, play with detail and in this case, um, mess with, with the mind of a heritage consultant. <coughs> 
the roof of this new section is fully glazed and has a completely operable surface. So in that one, in that one moment, there's a, a, a lot of drama. A, a architecture starts to enter into this otherwise very austere building. When that happens, it starts to get really interesting and that goes a little bit crazy as a building. The fact that the occupant can interact with the building is interesting because um, an otherwise abstract object becomes animated. So that little project is a, is a sentimental one because it reminds me of Mantova and reminds me of that day that we saw that beautiful building. So the idea now is that with the wonders of modern technology, I can go back to there and I can talk about any of those. If, if nobody is, is brave enough to ask me to talk about one, Matteo will, but I'm inviting you now to put up your hand and ask, would you like me to talk about one of these projects? Yeah. You can, me. Me. Uh, I don't know. I select this one. This, this, here, are two, here are two architects at the end of a hard day of work, having a very quick drink. It's true. No? Nobody? I can talk about uh, uh, another small project, maybe, or a big one. Talk about this one, you know, the, the RMIT project. So here's the city of Melbourne. It's about four million people in Melbourne. When, when you watch the tennis in the Australian Open, it's played there. The cricket and football played there. We have a, a gridiron city with a big civic spine and this project was on the end of the spine, commissioned in 2007, so a decade ago, um, when there's a reason for that photo. When uh, the university commissioned this work, we had no work at all in the office, and I thought we, I would have to close the office. So this project rescued the office, and the vice chancellor of the university was a fantastic patron. Um, there's a new vice chancellor now, and I'm sorry to have to report that he doesn't like my building, and it's not being well looked after. And Matteo and I were talking about this problem with architecture um, that is is common, unfortunately, and that is that the, the patronage of architecture is not where the problem ends. To make a building is only part of the exercise to maintain and look after the work that was patronised is as big an issue and sometimes more of an issue. There were two buildings that inspired my project. One was Jean Nouvel's Institut d'Arrive du Monde in Paris and the other was this remarkable building by Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers, also in Paris. The common theme now between the three projects is that the owners of the building aren't looking after the buildings properly. In the case of that remarkable facade done by Nouvelle as a young architect, you can see what's happened. Panels of glass have been removed randomly. Some of the, some of the um, diff light diffusers have been replaced with translucent film and so on. It's a great tragedy that that building is not better looked after. And similarly, um, this masterwork that Francesco recently wrote about in, in a remarkable um, book that most of you probably have read, is not properly looked after or maintained, and so the condition of the building is disappointing. And it doesn't do justice to the bravery of commissioning the work, um, the rigour and pain that the architects went through to make the work when the work is not maintained and looked after. And this is common. It happens all the time. The first time I went to visit Villa Savoy, it was a ruin. 
It's only been recently maintained, and I mean in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, similarly, the, the design hub, um, which I put a lot of, lot of work into. In my office, there's a lot of blood on the floor of the studio, I can promise you. We work very hard. And uh, in this building, we, we, we spent a lot of time to make what I think is a very beautiful, simple building. Now, unfortunately, being spoilt by the university that commissioned it. Um, and uh, it's a pity, but it happens. I'm not suggesting for a moment that I'm in the same league as John Nivelle or Renzo Piano or Richard Rogers, but I share the pain that they must suffer when they see their work treated badly. Uh, this is a, or it was designed as a postgraduate research building for design. Um, all design disciplines, industrial design, interior, landscape, aeronautical engineering, automotive engineering. Um, it's a, a full basement <clears throat> with a virtual reality studio, theater, uh, uh, function area, uh, model making and robotics, um, students display. It's all for postgraduate students, not an undergraduate. Um, a, large, a large exhibition space, a lecture theatre, and then uh, teaching students and uh, um, uh, research studios, an archive building, a forecourt that leads to further development, and then uh, seminar spaces on a roof terrace. And there it is just there. So the, the, that main tower is eight floors above the ground and the archive building is a single level that has a, two basement levels. So in 2007, the proposition of the facade of this building was that um, it could be upgraded over time to, as, to, as solar technology evolved to become the energy source for the building. And that proposition remains and in their own slightly clumsy way, RMIT are trying to have, um, have that change happen. The facade's operable. In its first iteration, it acts as a shade skin to reduce heat load on the building. And there are approximately 16 and a half thousand um, sandblasted glass discs, facade engineered by the Italian firm Permastelisa. Now, unfortunately, in this what was a vacant site when the building was completed, are a series of very ugly um, towers that are residential towers reasonably poorly designed, but they now fill that site. It's a completely different context to when we made this building nearly a decade ago. The, the sleeper in this scheme is that building. It's actually a delightful intersection of vertical and horizontal steel members to make a, make a lodgier space around a building. Everyone talks about the other bit. This is actually quite a nice bit. So a lot of time and energy went into that building. The solar technology that existed a decade ago is vastly different now, and the American firm Tesla has introduced a, a battery storage system that's actually viable. So um, you can imagine my frustration when RMIT tripped at the first opportunity to upgrade this, the facade to start to generate power. In theory, it's a proposition, but in theory, at the end of this decade, it's, it's feasible to imagine that all buildings can, can sustain their own power source. I can't see any reason why we wouldn't. And if one of the drivers for architecture now in, in the second decade of the 21st century is, is the environment and the state of the world environment. Why wouldn't we as architects at least contemplate that proposition and, and find ways of, of doing that in an elegant way and still dealing with the, with the rules of architecture as, 
as they existed hundreds of years ago. I guess one of the important things to say about this building is that it was detailed with a, a, pen, a clutch pencil and T-square and set-square with a pencil in an age where architects make the mistake of running to the computer far too early. I actually just sat in a room with a drawing board and drew this building and, um, and then inevitably elements of it became part of computer, computer programs. But its genesis was with the pencil. And so that rigour of detailing runs all the way through the building, which reinforces it as a piece of architecture. I made some nice references to architects whose work I admire. So the column there is straight out of, of Le Corbusier's buildings in India, complete with the same shuttering. Um, the, I, I should have mentioned before Michelangelo, the chapel of San Lorenzo, the Magnificent, um, Palladio and his, the, the, the layered facade of Il Redentore exist in this building in, in abstract forms. But to be a good architect, you have to know history and understand that we're not, we're, when we do a building, we're not the first ones who, who've done a building. People did them before we came along and they'll do them after we go. So we're part of a brief moment. It's that main exhibition space in this building the world's tallest sliding door. Although when I look in spaces like this, I take that back, it's probably not. It's in the lecture theatre. I think that's it. Okay, would anyone like to hear about another project? C, congratulations for being brave. Yeah, the M Pavilion is this one here, this one. This is a temporary pavilion commissioned by a Madonna in Melbourne, who's a friend who is currently in Venice because she's in charge of the Australian um, part of the Biennale. So she's a patron, she understands architecture, and uh, she decided why should, why should London have all the fun with the Serpentine Pavilion? We'll do a pavilion in Melbourne. But she changed the, the proposition so that after this pavilion was in situ for four months, it would be gifted back to the city. So what began life as a temporary pavilion for the summer months in Melbourne was then donated, in, in the case of my pavilion, to the Hellenic Museum. And it exists permanently in the garden of, of our museum. So it's, here's our site, just out of, out of the CBD, in a lovely park. <clears throat> this was the first in a series, so the second architect was the English architect Amanda Levite, then uh, uh, Studio Mumbai, and this year, Rem Coolhouse is doing a pavilion on the same site. I resorted to classicism very quickly in this project because it's what I understand. But I also made reference to the temporary nature of architecture in Australia. It's the antithesis of Italy. In Australia, we build with lightweight materials, um, with no substance like we have in the, in the buildings that are typical in Mantua, for example. Steel, timber, light, fall down, build it again. That's as a direct result of our colonial history. We're two, as a European country, we're 200 years old. The British would sail materials out to Australia on ships that would sink halfway. People in Australia were waiting for their building materials. They didn't arrive and they would have to invent ways of, of constructing and making. So that inventiveness is, is part of the DNA of, of most Australian architects, that we have to make do with what we have. Um, 
obviously that's that's a nostalgic and romantic view, but it's actually, it's true of our history that, that we came from that. Our architecture grows out of that and the very simple lean to buildings of um, people like Glenn Merkett come from that. So in this project I, ma I made a, a, a commentary on, on um, classicism and, and we're, we know because we're in the country that invented the arch that before the arch there was Traviation, that was, that was the Greek temple. So here is a little temp tempietto using the uh, idea and understanding of Traviation. So the grid of columns uh, becomes all important. Um, and then I wanted to play the game that I like to play, and that is to fool people into believing it's actually d dull and boring in there. Um, that this is, it, there's not much uh, architecture there, there's not, not a lot of form or shape making, that it's something that's quite, uh, on first glance, probably quite simple. Um, but then, um, then some magic happens with the facade and it ceases to be that abstract container and, and starts to be something that can be adapted and readapted over and over. So that's what that building's about. It's very simple. Recycled timber, galvanised steel, prefabricated so that it can be packed up and moved to another, another part of the city, which, where it is now. Um, and there you see that little chair, and ta there's a table in there that we designed, made, made out of skateboard templates. Skateboard, bent, chair. In uh, the case of this, um, this sculpture called the Pathfinder, he has a, um, a hammer, so he's a hammer thrower. It's been stolen so often, the city has stopped bothering replacing it. In first year at university, it's a challenge to go and steal the hammer. So this was a space for poetry readings, for music recitals, for performance, for talks and discussions, and so on, for four months over summer. I'm sorry. I forgot about that bit. Ta da! <laughs> okay. Can I show you a project that's under construction now that comes out of that project? Um, this one here. This is a, a house in the countryside on a, on a farm. So it's a farmhouse. And when architects who studied Corbusier talk about farmhouses, we talk about the Arcadian myth and the, and the dream of living on the land. And so this, is, is it, this client has the dream of living the life of, of pro producing their own existence. Um, it's a big site, relatively, and the need for placemaking existed in this project. So it required a gesture of, of a decent enough scale for the building to survive on what is effectively a large paddock. In the distance here is a, is a magnificent view, that, that view there. So. Uh, what I decided to do was, as you approach from this direction, was to force you back into the idea of the Parthenon and to, to have a three-quarter view to a building on a hill, leave the view, lose the view completely up a very steep driveway, and then find the building again. When you turn that bend on this driveway, you can see across the roofscape back to the view. So that's the picturesque at work, that's capability Brown mixing it, mixing it with the Greeks and the, and the Acropolis. Um, so this building is also like a temple, but it's a very simple L-shaped plan. The car arrives here from that driveway, one courtyard, one terrace, a very simple plan, and then um, the folly of the paddock running underneath this structure. 
which is a giant pergola. Um, the client said to me as recently as a week ago, what are we going to do under here? And I said, why do you have to do anything? We're just making the space. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll be okay. Um, so the view. A, a, a 30 metre, roughly 30 metre square shade structure that does what those buildings were doing. And there it is, under construction. So that, uh, that's one leg of the L there. It comes back towards, towards the screen. And then these posts. So down here, I can stand and look across the roofscape. By introducing a, a big element into, the, into that landscape, it creates a place and holds the building. This, is, this will be finished in, a, in five or six months' time, this building. <clears throat> I like building. I get the privilege of building. It's not a privilege that all architects have, and I, I don't take it for granted. In, in this building and another, another that's under construction at the moment, um, there's a lot of experimentation in detail, a lot of nuancing of detail in what is, is otherwise a fundamentally simple thing. So it's, for me, it's, it's always terrifying, always humbling, but also most satisfying to get a building to this point. And, and I, have, I take a lot of pleasure at this moment in a building to nuance it and to enjoy controlling the outcome. So those two projects are kind of linked, even though there are years between them. Anyone else? Signori, signorita, signorina. Ah. Yes. You can pick this one. Okay. This is also under construction. This is a little house on the coast, um, a very difficult client, a lawyer, very dangerous. <laughs> Mamma mia. <laughs> we, every time we do this project in the office, we go straight to the edge of our seats. So you be talking, working, this guy rings up, we all go, okay, <laughs> what do you want? He's very scary, but it's a nice project to do. Another L shape. This is right near the ocean, a very rugged coast near the Southern Ocean, at the bottom of the world. A, a, a simple carport, utility room, a terrace, a living, room, living wing and a bedroom wing. Um, the site. So this is uh, more, this uh, references more the idea that a number of those houses have had of, of exoskeleton, an, an exterior skin that protects the building, um, that veils the architectonics of the architecture so that they're less easily distinguished um, and has, a, has a, an environmental component. And that idea first, I'll show you, uh, after this project, I'll show you the project where that idea first started to take root in, in my office. But this is an investigation into the veranda, in fact, and it's an abstraction of the veranda and the idea of a veranda as a climate modifying device um, found, I think it emanated from Portugal, Eduardo can correct me, um, has, has found its way into the colonial architecture of particularly Great Britain and in, in the case of Australia became an, an appendage added to the Georgian house to help to try to cool it down. So it's a cooling device. Australia, like Italy, is a hot country and most importantly we need to be able to cool our buildings in hot weather. So a very steep sand dune. 
site with that agenda and there, and there it is also due to, for completion in five or six months. There you see the leg here. Now I can tell you a nice story about this building because the steelwork on this building is fantastic. It's, it's the best I've had. All the guys making the steel are Italian, all of them. They're, they are, it's like having a Ferrari made. They're, they're so particular and so involved that it has, it, it's been a complete pleasure. Their workmanship is, is fantastic. Uh, can you translate that in Italian for me, what I just said, so that people... Don't drive that model. <laughs> So it's nice, don't worry, it's like, oh, it's, you, you can say. About the, about the Italian. Do they, you reckon they understood that? They, they understood what I said there? So, what a fantastic project. A beautiful view. And an exciting thing to get to build. I love the steel, it's so much, it's a lot of fun to build with. Um, it's, for me, a great pleasure and it's why, um, I'll show you another project, hang on. This one is good. Okay, so um, I mentioned uh, another project that informs that work from, this is now 20 years ago, so going back for, uh, a long time ago, 20 years ago, this is for the photographer who takes the photos of my work, um, El Carter. And this is a, again an investigation into the idea of the temple on the Acropolis, but very simple plan, uh, a weekend house, a, a, a ground floor for guests, a middle floor for the owner, and a, a top floor for living. And again on a sand dune, and in this building, I, f I first worked out where my, my, I wanted to take my work, the idea of the skin and the idea of the veranda becoming one thing, right? Very, very nice, simple plan. I, I can tell you a story that I made we put the floor down, I didn't, I wanted the floor to feel old, I didn't want it to feel new. I made my office go down there and sand the floor by hand and oil it by hand um, over a number of days. It was, uh, it was hard work, we, although we had four people then so it wasn't so hard. And the owners worked as well on it. Um, yeah, so that little project, but we're now doing another house for these people. That's their weekend house. We're now giving them a house to have a holiday from their holiday house. That's this project. So this, this is in, in a prefabricated house, one room, inspired by um, this, pr uh, oh, mamma mia. I thought there was a picture. Richard Rogers did a house in the 1960s called the Zip Up House. It's beautiful. This house is a house that you can pick up here, move to the site, put it in the site. It's one room, the site is 400 acres. It's a sliding wall, it's not a room. A bathroom, a kitchen. A little deck area and a, and, a, and a balcony with a seat. The site is very quintessentially Australian. There are snakes, lizards, eagles, koalas, kangaroos, everything that can kill you in two minutes or less on this site with granite boulders everywhere. It's quite spectacular, very beautiful. And you recognise these mountains in Australia, that's a mountain, here it's a hill. Um, 
it's, it's, it has a different view of the house I showed you earlier. It's two houses looking at the same thing. Ah, this building. It's intriguing. So here's this building. Wrapped in a perforated steel skin. With these kind of eyelets, so lift it and place it. We should only be on site for a few days. So, how are we going for time? Good. Anything else? Anyone like me to talk about anything else? I can talk about another project. Yes. This one? This guy walked into my office one day. He introduced himself. This was in 2003. He said, hi, my name's Damien. I, I've heard you're a good architect. My friend told me you were good. I'd like to, you to do me a house. I said, great. He said, um, I live in Hong Kong now with my family, my wife and my, my children, but we, we want to come back to Australia. I'm sick of living in Hong Kong. I miss, miss the weather, the seasons. I like winter and summer and autumn and spring. I said, great. He pulled a drawing out of his pocket with a plan on it. He said, my idea is to build a series of pavilions on my site. So living room, walk outside, kitchen, walk outside, bedroom. I said, it's a really interesting idea. I, I said, what does your wife think about this idea? He said, oh, I'm too scared to tell her. I was hoping you would tell her. I said, okay, we can, we can try this idea because it is interesting to transition space by exiting the building and going back in the building. It's quite interesting, intriguing idea, really. So I said, well, let's try, try something. So we, did, we ended up with this where you arrive at the top of these stairs, enter a living room pavilion, go back outside, but undercover, and enter bedrooms. This is a, this is a library, but bedrooms. It's a weekend house here. So we built the building and um, the wife was very nervous. I said, it's okay. We'll, if, if you don't like it, we'll build, this, we'll build a wall here, no problem. Of course, I was never gonna build a wall there. It was a lie, but she loves the house, which is a relief. This house has a beautiful view to the ocean, but it's, you have to get up to see it. You, you drive here, a wine cellar and storeroom here, um, a shower to wash the sand off when you come back from the beach, and then up. So this, this building was about the idea of, of when do I engage with architecture? Is it when I enter the architecture or is it when I start thinking about entering the architecture? In the case of a weekend house, it's a conscious de decision to encounter the architecture by getting in the car and going there. So the first thought about this building isn't when you enter, it's when you decide to get into the car and go. And that idea of journey and discovery and reward is something that you can work with with a building it creates theatre, in, even in a very simple plan. And the idea of an anticipation is fantastic in architecture. You can feel yourself getting excited when you know you're going to encounter space that's intriguing. Today, when I w walked up past the market to go to the Palazzo di Cale, I remembered from our last visit the vault that takes you into the Palazzo Castello. Piazza Castello, excuse me. That vault is cut on an angle, it's really beautiful. A great piece of urban design. And as I walked near, I said to, uh, I said to my wife, uh, this, is, this is really exciting because I, this, I, I'm about to encounter something I know is good. So here in this building, is the, that's the idea. 
the expectation and excitement builds as you approach on the basis that you get, when you arrive, a beautiful view of the, of, of the ocean. So our site is here. There's the buildings so wrapped in, in, in industrial floor grating. Um, the view from the house over the road. So we built this building and all the owners around complained they didn't like it. Then they started selling their houses and leaving. <laughs> I, I, I said in the office, I said, this is a good sign. We've done a good piece of architecture. Everyone else hates it. So in the design of a building like that, obviously the roofscape becomes important. So this becomes an elevation. It's very hard to deal with a roof. A roof is where all the stuff goes to control a roofscape to preserve the amenity of the um, building over the, over the road that has that quite spectacular view. And of course in Australia every day is sunny with blue skies, you can tell from the photographs. Since doing this house, we did this guy's uh, altered his house in town for him. He's a lovely client. So when I do these buildings, the, we, we detail and make everything. So all the window frames, everything is drawn, made. And Matteo and I were talking about that problem in architecture now, the, 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 the loss of, of, of <coughs> the loss of will to detail, to make the detail, to deal with the responsibility of the detail. Now, normally when architects do windows, they pick from catalogues and they're all the same. I can get the same aluminium window in Melbourne as I can get in Milan. It's not a big deal to deal with the consequences of the detail for, for this sort of thing is really important, I think, for architecture. And if we lose that, we are reduced to being the selectors of colours and the makers of shapes. And think about, for example, the work of Elvar Elto and the evolution of the detail in Elto's work. It's incredibly important. It becomes an architecture's handwriting. So these buildings are about that. Um, and that may, means that they happen more slowly. And uh, I, unfortunately, I'm a very slow architect. It takes a long time to make them. And we're living in an age of impatience and speed. So I'm not sure how much longer I'll last. OK. You tell me when I've got to stop. I, 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 can, keep talk I can keep talking. No one else? Yes. Top right. Here. Yeah. This one. Uh, this was a school, a science faculty building that we did in, designed in uh, about 1999, so a long time ago. Um, Cla teaching classrooms and laboratories, a small aquarium and a greenhouse, and a, and a seminar room at an existing school campus south of Melbourne. Uh -oh. Something's happened. Hit that. Tech guy. Where's that guy? Sorry. Just need to be able to move to the next image. It's, it's frozen. While we sort that out, the, this school had rules for construction. 
only that's it. Only single story, only timber or brick, no other materials. So we did this building out of uh, a, a, an Australian timber, iron bark and plywood, very cheap, not expensive, and some steel. Uh, we set up a new quadrangle here, to, sorry, here, to be the basis of more future projects. And um, I made a building with a translucent roof, uh, so the whole of the building is a skylight. This was the first building that I made which could har harvest the rainwater. So all of the, because this is about 1,200 square metres, this building, all of the rainwater in this building goes to tanks and is used elsewhere on the school. Uh, back in those days, that was quite radical. Now it happens all the time. That was such a big deal. I just ma I, I made a cloister, a, a loggia. You know, it's it's a simple simple skin for students to move between classes. At the same time that I was doing that project, I did this one. So concurrent, this this house here. which was a house for a bachelor. Um, and I, a house for a bachelor, when we started, by the time we'd finished, he got, he was married. Things became very tense very quickly. It was interesting. He was very relaxed when he was single. It's a three, it's three rooms, this house. Um, Interest, I was interested in the work of the British architect John Soane and his own building in Lincoln's Inn Fields in London, which is incredibly beautiful, very complex, full of stolen antiquities, I hasten to say, but um, complex in terms of the way you engage with the space. And so arrival um, da down through a loggia space, a glimpse into a courtyard, but no idea of how to find that space down the steps, um, arrive at the, at the food. Food in these buildings is always made at the, the arrival point. The, there's no formal dining spaces in any of those houses. Food speaks all languages. And um, in Australia, the, the kitchen table is, is a very important space. Um, and uh, so a living, a living space, a library, bathroom and then a secret door, a door behind a secret panel. You can only go through that door if you know that it exists or if you're invited, which for at the time a single guy was quite quite seductive. If you're invited into the private realm of the building, you start to do a loop in, in terms of the circulation and come back, find that courtyard. Behind a second secret panel is is the only bedroom. Of course married with children now, the house is quite impractical. So recently he's asked me to look at making a guest house on the next property along, which is, is designed, we're waiting to build it. It's a circle embedded in the ground. It's the complete opposite of this building. But this building and the science faculty building were done at the same time. There it, there it is there. This um, is a, a skin of Jarra, recycled, reclaimed timber that was otherwise being thrown away by the mill, turned into a skin wrapping over the building. The roof of the building is glazed. Um, and opera the facade is operated by a very simple gas strut like the back of a hatchback car. This, uh, this tree we had an arborist work out was 350 years old. So 150 years older than white settlement in Australia. So we kept it, it became important. This, tim this uh, facade is now beautifully weathered to a silvery gray color. It's a little library space, the living space with the glazed roof. 
and the, and the nighttime shot that all architects have to remind them that's the last shot of the project in, in the presentation. This was a competition that uh, you might have seen in Casabella, which we did uh, two, three years ago, I can't remember, but uh, this was a project for a contemporary art museum in Sydney, a competition with, um, sorry, my mind has gone blank. A competition with a number of architects. Um, uh, Sajima, Kazuo Sajima. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I forget. But the, was it for a, an addition to this building? Um, and uh, I think Herzog and De Muron and some others. And we added a very simple building. The, the idea of this building was to try to make a marketplace on the podium. This, in, if you have been to Sydney, you will know that the building, the existing building, this art gallery, is away from the CBD. That access line there links the centre of the CBD to the site. This bay is a secondary bay. This is a very early part of the evolution of Australia very old, um, and uh, I tried to set up some sort of order that was based on the, on the urban scale of Sydney rather than the site, and um, failed dismally by not winning the competition that we were talking about. Um, and, and all the architects in the room who ever failed at a competition can never understand quite why we didn't win, but that's okay. We, we, we live to fight another day. And uh, that's why Corbusier always drew himself as a boxer, so we keep fighting. Um, so it was a big public space to link this existing building with a new building on, on, on that ground plane, to create an underground connection back to the CBD, uh, to, um, to acknowledge and line up with the existing botanic gardens there which are quite beautiful and uh, um, so and, and to deal with the program of the competition so you know we talked about this was a two-phase competition we had to get to the second second phase and in the first phase I have a tiny office two to three is the, mac is, the, is the number all the time and doing a competition like that for two or three people is very hard to do and run other projects and we talked about in the first phase what, how should we present this to try to get to a shortlist and I said we should, uh, we should just copy Carlo Scarpa and do, do work the way he does work so our first submission was pencil, drawings, lots of sketches no computers, <clears throat> and and we drew those, did those drawings, and we got to the next stage, and we incorporated a lot of those those drawings into our final panels. So we've stolen from Italy again with with Carlo Scarpa. It's very simple, Patti. To, to solve the problem of dual entries, this is the entry of that existing building. Excuse me, we turned the front of this building into a moat, forcing people to walk down to here, finding this space and entering into, into here if they're coming from that direction, coming through the gardens into there, so this became a common um, foyer, and then into the building through an atrium space. 
there's a 20 metre level difference between here and here. And so I designed a, an, an, a glass clad obelisk that doubled as a, as a vertical connector to get people from this common plaza level down to, to that level there. Um, and this, if you've ever been to Sydney, this freeway takes you into the city. You go through that tunnel and as you emerge, you see a Renzo Piano building right on the axis, the Aurora Tower. So it's a potent place. Uh, we brought water into this scheme and we had other ideas of connecting the site with ferries and so on. And these little sketches are, are sketches tr trying to explain the thinking behind the idea. Uh, the, the level below, full of uh, galleries, an Aboriginal um, gallery with an outdoor courtyard space. So, so that hole in the ground is actually open to the air. The idea here was to bring um, sand from the desert in the outback of Australia and make that space part of the outback. An Asian art gallery, contemporary art. Um, I proposed a gallery for architecture go into, into that existing space. This little thing here was a lookout projecting out of the facade of the building so you could lie on the floor and look down at the expressway, look at the cars, and so on, and so on. So a lot of, a lot of hard work. Um, so you, your question about scale, in, in my office, I, I'm very happy to work from big scale to s small scale. Very, yeah, it was your question. So, for, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright said, it doesn't matter whether it's a chicken shed or a cathedral, it's the quality of the project. So I like that saying. So if I do a little chair or do this, the, for me, the, the, those skills are, are taught skills. You learn them and you learn them by exposing yourself as a young architect to big practice as well as small practice, which is what I did intentionally. So I don't have a problem dealing with that scale. The, the design hub is 13,000 square metres. I think this was over 100,000 square metres, this building in total. I honestly can't remember. Um, going down, there's the, 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 the freeway building becomes divided, bifurcates and, and then connects again in that plaza level. And we don't do computer renderings in my office so we're at the mercy of other people and we were talking before the, t the lecture about the problem with competitions now is that it's about the rendering, not about the design. Um, you get that, right? <laughs> so, the, you know, that's, that's, that's me drawing. That's me designing. That's not me drawing, that's some other guy doing it. Um, anyway, we didn't win. It's, it's Sajima won. And, uh, and I, I hope it's a great scheme for the city. If it works well, fantastic. Um, there you can see the water, the plaza, the marketplace, the idea of art as, as accessible for the public to come to the place without necessarily entering the museum. There's a lot of talk and thought about that, the obelisk in the background. And we still make models in my office. There's something about making a physical model that's beautiful. Look at those over there. Um, if you make a beautiful model, you make a beautiful building, usually. If you don't care about the model, you don't care about the building. So thanks for bringing that up. It still upsets me, that project, but that's OK. <laughs> yes. Third row, one, two, three, four, five. 
This one I showed already. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> For the the bridge. Ah. Oh. Yeah. We got a commission to do a bridge, a footbridge for pedestrians, but also for horse riders, for people on horses. Um, suddenly, suddenly, a, a, a very simple problem becomes complex when a person is riding a horse over a bridge because they're much higher. So we had the issue of safety and height over a freeway. Um, but it was a lot of fun to do. Um, I, I can't remember the span, I think here was about 38 metres. A, a boxed beer and deal truss. Um, veiled with, with steel louvers. Um, and then the bridge lifted into place and placed on legs. And a little bit of landscape work either side. So a seat for people, a, 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 a place to rest if you're walking or running or riding. Um, we designed the railing to be a hitching post so you could tie your horse to it. And then to deal with the with the height of the bridge to bring the scale down, back down to a human scale, but to still create a safe environment for horse riders, we splayed the top of the bridge. Um, I'd love to do another bridge. Bridges are uh, very good fun to do because they're pure engineering. Architects probably get in the way of the process, but it's, it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, that's the bridge. Not a lot to say about a bridge. It gets you from one point to the other and back again. But, uh, we, didn't get to do, we didn't get to make this. We weren't, we weren't the supervising architect, the, the road authority in, in Melbourne took that over. So we, that was slightly frustrating. seen a, a house that's nearly about to start is this one. Here is a house for an elderly person, a single elderly person. This is an interesting problem for architects to design for the ageing, to make the house accessible, simple, easy to maintain and inexpensive to run is a, a good problem for all architects to try to solve. It's another building with a pergola and pavilions under the pergola. Very small, 100 square metres, 120 square metres, being documented at the moment. With a very simple roofscape in, the, in suburban Melbourne. For the person who does my bookkeeping, my accounting, so it's very important that we get this project right. <laughs> so, maybe we talk about one more. Uh, would anyone like to hear one more project? Oh. Future shape? Two more projects, yeah. This is a project I did when I was a student, so it's going back to the mid-1980s. So I was interested in... I was, I was interested in modernism, so modernism gained its voice in the post-war housing that was represented in the Weisenhof exhibition in Germany, in Stuttgart. So. The problem then was to mass produce housing to solve the post-war housing crisis. Mass production was part of that ethos and the argument for the machine age. 
The buildings themselves were built traditionally, but they were made to look like mass-produced buildings. And I was interested in, in challenging modernism as a student. I, I loved it and appreciated it always, but I wanted to try to challenge it. In those houses that I've shown you, I, in those early buildings, I took the section out of the architecture deliberately um, and tried to modify the space using other devices. I took the purity of, of the work of Mies out of the building and made the materials crude to challenge modernism. And in this building, I tried to make a genuine, genuine mass-produced building instead of making a building look like it was mass-produced. Um, so I took the idea of the shipping container. A shipping container is a ubiquitous object. It's found everywhere in the, on the planet. The infrastructure for shipping containers is found everywhere. It's the same thing in Australia, in Italy, in America, in Africa, in South America. You can find a shipping container. You can find the stuff that handles and moves a shipping container and lifts it up. So as a student, I designed this 20-foot container converted. A decade later, um, I had a, enough money to make one, which is this prototype, which is modified to make a space to, to, to live in, in the event of a natural disaster um, where people are displaced. So, Displacement is usually dealt with by the United Nations by the introduction of tents and people are housed in tents after an emergency, a flood, an earthquake. Tents only last for so long and then, then you get inherent social um, issues and inherent health issues. The ability to provide mid-term accommodation between the destruction of a place and the, and the recreation of the place is what is behind the thinking behind this idea. So to have something robust that you can get off the ground, that's secure, that can be stockpiled, packed up, used again, and then stockpiled again is the idea and handled easily. So um, the, the parasol, this is, this is an old project, so we've moved along, but the parasol supports solar, makes shelter, gathers water, says house, that's a universal symbol, and so on. It's, it's a very simple fit out to make a, a place to place to prepare food, a place to eat the food, a place to sleep, and a place to wash. So it, it forces the question to define house as an architect. What is a house? Is it a palace? Is it a room? For some people, a house, a house is the street. And that, that project led me to, to a couple of other projects, like this one, which is the... Oh, excuse me. Park Bench House. I went there too quickly. Okay. So this, this asks the question about urban infrastructure. Question, these are questions that architects should always be asking. When someone is homeless, where do they go? They usually seek out constructed, in, you know, something constructed, because it's providing shelter. So if we make a, a bench during the day that converts at night to a shelter, then we're actually addressing and answering the question of what a house is. For some people, that's, a, that's luxury, right? So normally architects design, design for one or two percent of the population. The other 98 percent never talk to us, but their needs still exist. So, so this, that project and, uh, and uh, this project This one, a, a bus shelter. The bus shelter converts to a bed. The advertising hoarding dispenses a blanket. 
instead of advertising and generating money, it, it's a chance for artists to display their work if they don't have a gallery. Um, you can get a, a cup of tea or coffee from this idea. It's, it's, it's just saying people are going to go there anyway. Why not engage rather than shun them? So those, those three projects are linked. There's one guy that he's passed through to. Come down. Oh, well, yeah, no. at, at the risk of labouring Frank Lloyd Wright, when he, he, he was asked that question, he said, my favourite project is the next one. So, of course, architect, well, Architects are never, I'm never satisfied. I'm never happy. I always see the problem and the fault and what I could have done better and try to make the next project better. And, um, and you know, that, that's very important. It's, it would be the height of conceit to say, oh, that's a really good one. It would be the end of, end of my practice if I did it. The, um, the way I, just to get that over. the way I do that is I do this. Can I? Ah. The way I, the way I, I do that is I make sure that I keep drawing. It's really important for architects to draw with a pencil. Um, to always draw, it means that you're always critiquing. And to draw and to be able to look and say, I did that detail and I got it wrong. Last, last building, I can get that right. Or it, that, that didn't really work properly. Or I could make it work a little bit better or a little bit differently. It means that even though this work has a common theme, it's constantly being nuanced and evolving. And, and, and that, I'm the critic who, who says that. I say that wasn't good enough. When we did the St Andrews house, this one, the, f the, first, the first thing I did with this building was I went through with my sketchbook and I wrote down everything that was wrong. And don't do that again. You know. A reminder to myself to not not become lazy. You need the you need the rigor of ex exploring the, the building to, to to its utmost. So those 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 houses that are under construction that I showed. Uh, if I can quickly show. <coughs> For, for example, in this building here, the, this is a decade later, the sophistication in the details way, way advanced. Um, here, you know, in, in around here, the, there's a maturity in that detailing that only comes from criticism of the earlier work. So I'm sounding a bit preachy when I say that, but that's very important. You can never, never stop and say, that's, I've done that. Um, it's dangerous to do that. Suicidal, I'd say. Okay. Would anyone like to ask any questions? Is that we at that point? Would anyone like to ask any, any other questions or we can wrap it up? There, it's a, an actuator, a German product that is a very simple... Do you want to do that? Yeah, maybe. So.
the panels in the pavilion in Melbourne works? These ones. So if, if I can find a photo. Each panel has an electronic actuator. There you can just see one there. Two. two. Um, so very simple, not, not hydraulic, electric. They're made in Germany. I'll, I'll, if, I, if I tell you who makes them, I'll have to kill you. So. Uh, and um, they, they run through a remote control. Remote control. The owner of the building. The, the person who owns the building can operate the building. So you can run that through your smartphone, through your iPhone. It's very, very simple technology. They're very well made. But that's, otherwise that's just physics. But to def defy gravity is beautiful. It's, it's poetic. When it, if, 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 I do, if I swing a door that way, it's okay. You can do that pretty easily. If I do that, it's much harder. To do it successfully is very, very hard. And to do it dramatically is, is, is what those buildings are about. Design Hub has a different device but similar idea. Um, it's underutilized there. It's programmable, so you can you can change the building. But um, they tend to have left it left it on a simple program. Um, So they're in gangs and they operate through a small actuator that runs through the building, building's brain. You know, buildings have brains now, the computer runs the building, like a car. And uh, uh, I, you can uh, maybe just see, if you, if you go to that building you can see the actuators lighting up. They operate 21 at a time. So, and, and not every not every circle operates. How are we going? I'll, I'll give you a clue. I'll show you the next image. Yes. So going to, to a kind of your dichotomy between uh, being engineer or uh, bricoler uh, or you know, bricoler is something that has to do with other, the, the, uh, uh, Levi Strauss and the famous, famous book. Uh, in a certain way, every time you have to refound the word Palladian architecture during the Thomas Jefferson period in America or you know, in, in your country, I think a, a conversation between you and Glen Market, you know, about the relation with nature and in which way architecture represents a kind of an instrument, like a musical instrument, and the, occupant, and the occupant represent so the, the audience, and at the end, the, the nature represents the music, at the, end, you know, the situation with the landscape. Uh, what I think is, uh, in a certain way, transforming uh, trivial materials like steel, you see, because we, we use like, the, the, the trivial materials in a certain way, transforming in a high, high grow level, contrast level, huh? like a, a kind of classicity at the end. So, uh, what about of uh, an, a very typical Italian concept now, because it, we are complicated, because the history, you know, very well. And the concept of sprezzatura, you know. Sprezzatura means something, introducing some mistake, voluntary mistake, just to say, okay, it's not so perfect, mm -hmm. no? Because in a certain way, many of your buildings seems to be at the first time, I, I think because it, it, the problem is the positive aspects are very, very tremendously photogenic, no? Tremendously photogenic. But I think to appreciate it much more your building is necessary to go there to go there, to go inside, to open the windows, to, to move the elements, no? 
Mm. This is another paradox. Mm. The, the, the persiana, you know, persiana is it's the, the typical window, no, the painted in, in green, no, it's movable, it's movable. And I think that the sprezzatura, the Australian translation of sprezzatura is probably is this movability, no, something that is produce a kind of, no, picturesque effect, yeah. but at the end you are absolutely classic in the sense, elevating, rising the level of this, the seems to be only construction, no, kind of Misian concept. So, um, at the end, I think it's a tremendous photogenic effect of your architecture needs to go there, probably to appreciate much more, much more, and the, the real, the real value of that, no, I think. Uh, I don't know if it's a comment or it's mm. just to, but feel you that, which is your feeling, uh, much more has to do with engineering, uh, probably not, because many mistakes, uh, the Institute of Mondarab, it's a completely fitting because the, the, the moving of, I don't know, the mechanism of, of the light control, it's not perfect. No, I don't know. Um, hmm. It's difficult to, to explain, but at the end, I, I think we are a little bit Italian when you introduce the movement. Yeah. Uh, the movability, it's really a secret. And, and, and with the photographs, it's impossible to reproduce, I think. It's, it's a pity. No? Well, you can, I, I, I understand what is Paolo. It's, it's interesting. We were talking about that before. The, there's a desire with a, with a lot of architects to only seek the photograph of their work and not the engagement with, with an architecture spatial. It's three-dimensional. The, my aspiration for simplicity alone isn't ever going to cut it architecturally. So you have to bring some drama back into the building. And I do that by, by allowing the occupant of the building to engage with it. So that, so that you know, the, 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 the little beach house, the tower house, um, was the first time that I did that where on a, on, a, on a hot uh, summer's day, it closes down. On a, on a sunny winter's day, it opens up and suddenly it, it's dynamic. But the plan is 12 metres by 6 metres. Very simple. If, if the building was just that plan with a nice bit of fenestration, it'd be okay, we'd, we'd say it was okay, but with the drama of the interaction of somebody, then it does become imperfect in a moment because suddenly you can see through to the to the fenestration, see through again. So that's what that's that's what um, adds interest to those buildings. But they're spatial as well. They're complex spatially. They're, they're deceptively simple in plan. They're highly theatrical in, in in the way you move through the building, and they're very contrived on a certain level um, in terms of their engagement with the landscape. And in my in um, in, in my case, the engagement with landscape comes straight out of 18th century England and, and Capability Brown and, the, and, and, and interest in the picturesque. So a lot, of that, a lot of those plans, like the plan I showed you where you drive, you see the building, you lose the building, you find the building again, you, you, just, just before you arrive you see across the roofscape, and that's, that's a series of events to transform a simple plan into a dramatic thing. Doesn't, doesn't work just to do that. So I, I think what you were getting at too is the, you know, with the, with, in, 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 in ancient Greece and classical Rome, the imperfections were brought into the buildings so that the gods weren't upset. I mean, those buildings, my buildings are certainly not perfect, but they don't aspire to be either. They, they, they aspire to be resolved. Within the resolution, there is, um, there is, in my personality, the need to ensure that everything is thorough and complete. But they also, re they, re when you're in them, they, they relax very quickly as buildings. And I mean, the, I was giving a hint that we're getting to the end, but we, we probably are anyway. In this building, for example, um, a very a very simple party, outdoor space, indoor space, outdoor space, sleeping, um, setting setting the landscape. Um, 
the critical critical moment spatially in this building is is this continuous window seat. This this element here, which the ground levels at the top of the seat, you can see the ground there, so it's just set down into the building. So that is a sun-filled, beautiful space to go to with a drink or a cup of coffee or whatever, and it anchors the, the building, so it runs through. So it's a, it's a primary device, but it's, it's about sitting and enjoying. It's not about the other things. So, yes, everything's detailed, but yes, it's, in, in, in a case like that, it's primarily about that, that thing there. A humanising device. Right, so. Okay. I think we're done, aren't we? Is there any more questions before we finish? One more. You'll have to grab the microphone so everyone can hear. Question about I don't know if it was uh, was something similar to the last uh, question was about the um, the wall in your projects the wall the walls the walls um, the walls yes um, in uh, Mediterranean architecture the the wall is something um, uh, with a thickness something very uh, permanent in the project that uh, like uh, rooted with the ground and uh, uh, is it, um, gives the direction of the internal parts and this uh, is a strong boundary. Instead in your projects, uh, there is a complete, uh, not complete, but a different uh, view of uh, the world. Um, for example, the building seems to float on the ground they are very thin and also it's possible to open completely them. They are like uh, something very dynamic, not uh, uh, permanent. Um, the question is, what is, what does the wall mean uh, ah, inside the... It's the a good project? question. So, until the laws of gravity change, there are two ways to do a wall in a building. One is a massive load-bearing wall like the building we're in now. And the other is trabeation, post and beam. My buildings are about posts and beams. They're not about heavy load bearing. With a heavy load bearing wall, you have to cut an opening in the wall. There's one up there. With post and beam, you don't have to worry about that. You can do anything with the wall, provided occasionally there's a post and a beam. And the reality of architecture is, with, with one possible exception, and that's Buckminster Fuller and then what Peter Rice did with that, where you know, space frames and that sort of, that sort of stuff. Really, it doesn't matter about the shape or the form, they're the two rules that you need to know. As a student, I'm assuming you're a student, the sooner you learn those rules, the better, because it frees you up completely. And when I was studying, I was studying at the tail end of postmodernism where everything was load-bearing, holes in the walls. All the, all the gun architects in, in that era were doing that. And I didn't want to do that. So I said, well, what, what are they doing? And it's a simple lesson in history. That's how walls have been done for a long time. And you make a lintel over the opening. Or you don't do it that way. You, do, you, you make a frame and steel gives you the ability to do that. So, steel and concrete. So the Domino House, Corbusier's seminal piece, was the first time an architect said, actually, you can do something a different way. And from that, from that moment on, there were two choices. It, when, when you study, I'm assuming you study, Corb, when you, when you learn the five points towards a new architecture, you understand that they were only able to come about because of the Domino House and the ability to free the facade up and so on. So that's, so, so that's what I chose to do very early. That's why those buildings can do that. Other architects do the buildings a different way and they're just as powerful. I was looking at the backside of the Palazzo today. It's a remarkable example of load-bearing masonry.
Fantastic. So it's just a question of what, what you're most comfortable with. That's all. It's no, there's no other magic or secret to that. Okay. We're done. Okay. We're going to drink beer now, right? Yeah. <laughs>